I'm reading from Matthew 11, from verses 16 to 20, and also 25 to 30. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to others, We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Woe on unrepentant towns! Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of his miracles had performed, because they did not repent. The Father revealed in the Son. At that time Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned, and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Our reading this morning is from Romans chapter 7, and I'm reading from verses 15 to 25. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Good morning, Somerset West. Oh, Stellenbosch, I'm in the Somerset West building doing a recording. Uh, thanks to Sasha for helping me. Um, and it's good to be with uh, you guys at Stellenbosch uh, again. Um, I, I had a friend um, whose father I buried many years ago. And uh, he, he only ever called me the Greek, because I'm Greek. Um, and I was reminded of this just the other day because I happened to, to see the friend and have, have lunch with him after quite a few years. Um, being with him reminded me of another situation in that church when I, where I was working as a student, where one of the elders made an appointment with the minister. He had been an elder a long time, a member a long time. But he came to talk about a sermon that I had preached and I was uh, a bit nervous about it because he told me I'm going to talk to Charles about your sermon on Sunday. Charles came out and said, this is what the guy said, the young Greek got to be on Sunday. Now, it's not important what I said or, who, or who said it, but something happened between God and that man that day and he was reporting back to his own minister as to, where, as to how that happened. So I want to pray that you will let God get to you today. Not, not Rod, God, let the word of God dwell in you richly. 
Okay, my wife and I have had, in the 45 years of our marriage, 14 robberies. A crowbar to our security gate and front door, and out when cameras and computers and TVs. A car was stolen off our driveway before we had fencing. A floor to ceiling French glass door was smashed twice to different robberies and various precious items stolen. So you work it out 14 in 45 years, one every three years. Seeing that the last robbery was seven years ago, the law of averages is that we're overdue for the next one. Now you've got to keep a sense of humor about these things sometimes, even though a law has been violated and broken. Here's an example. Two months after one of these robberies, my wife stretched deep into the dark back of her cupboard to pull out her hiking boots. Didn't use them often, but there they were. Out came a pair of boots, but they weren't hers. <laughs> Same size, just much older, well-worn, and significantly smellier. We worked out that the thief had taken his off and put them at the back and walked out the house with her brand new boots. The law, we, 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 we love and work against the law. It's meant to help us. And it's very irritating when it's broken against us. But I'm a lawbreaker. Just this morning, opening up my WhatsApps and uh, emails, there's a fine from the municipality of Darling. I went to preach there a month or two ago, and somewhere along the line, I broke the speed limit. Uh, nothing irritates me more than a speeding fine, because you cannot blame anybody else for it. I can't remember the, seeing the camera, I can't remember seeing the flash, but I'm out of pocket by 400 rand, you know. I'm a lawbreaker. Sometimes I park where I shouldn't park. Sometimes I jump through a yellow stroke red light. Sometimes I don't stop at a stop street, especially at night if the, it's quiet. And instead of feeling bad about these things, I, I, I discover that uh, sometimes I'm, I'm quite pleased with myself for having got away with it, as it were. When it comes to God's laws, well, that's embarrassing. Do not tell lies. Well, I do. Sometimes you call them white lies, but a lie is a lie. What about keeping the Sabbath holy? You know, I, I grew up in a non-Christian home. Sun has been nothing. And I joined a church when I was converted in Durban where I went straight after worship on Sunday to watch professional soccer at Kingsby Soccer Stadium because in Durban you could do what you like on a Sunday. I moved to Belleville as a young minister and, and, and I discovered the shops didn't open on Sundays. It was like weird, you know. I had a, an elder tell me that he was mowing his lawn on a Sunday and, and a neighbor was walking down towards him past his house with his wife and his dog. And when he came past the, the elder mowing his lawn, all he said was, we don't do those things on Sundays. <laughs> Such kind of strange respect for the Sabbath. What's the law of Christ? Only once in the New Testament is that phrase used, the law of Christ. I wonder if you know what it is. Paul says, Galatians 6 verse 2, the law of Christ is carrying each other's burdens. Well, <laughs> I'm a lawbreaker. I'm guilty of that. I can see burdens. I don't always want to carry them. Sometimes the phone goes, and before I even know who's on the end of it, I say to my wife, don't answer it. <laughs> don't answer it. I'm eating supper or whatever. Don't want to pick up anyone's burdens. Hmm. So if, if you're slightly guilty, well, that's a bit stupid because, you know, you're slightly pregnant, you know. <laughs> If you know that you add to South Africa's general sense of lawlessness, you do talk on your phone when you drive in. Just be jolly glad that the full weight of the law is not applied to us all the time, even from God's side. 
But Paul once claimed that with regard to keeping God's law, he was as good as the best of the Pharisees. I don't think he's been arrogant. I think it was what he wanted and what he believed about himself, that he was scrupulous, he was attentive, he was a fundamentalist with regard to obedience. But in the passage we read today from Romans 7, thank heavens Paul reveals, after all, he is just like us. So likely to fail that he says, there's a law, a law working in me. Just like the law of gravity, I, I seem to have to obey it. Listen, he says, I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there. In my inner being, I actually delight in God's law. But in, 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 in my body, in the outworking of my body, I, I see this war being waged against my mind. And I'm actually a prisoner in the end of my body. I do what I don't want to do. He even uses the phrase, I do what I hate. And then he says, what a wretched man I am. And we are wretches. Hey, Senabosh, I preached to you three weeks ago about taking one day at a time and doing one kind thing, loving, generous thing to somebody unlike yourself, to be unlike Sarah, I said, and love someone else. And I wonder if you did it. I wonder if you made a promise to yourself to do it. I wonder how many of us broke those promises because we, we fell under the power of this law. We seem to do what we don't want to do. And we don't do what we think we want to do. Okay, I'm going to presume that we're all in the same boat. And therefore, I hope that we are in the same boat. And all like Paul will ask the same question. Who will deliver me from this body of death? This mechanism of a law at work in us. And I hope, like Paul, we can all answer the question for ourselves in the same way. Who will deliver us from this body of death, making these death-like decisions? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord, is Paul's answer. We go to Jesus, in other words. And then we do what he tells us to do. What he suggests we do, what, what, what thoughts he puts into our mind. Go... Go and do this, not, not to earn your forgiveness, but just get back on the right path. You know? um, I, I was once knocked over by a car when I was learning to ride a bike. That probably explains a lot of things about my life. But um, I, I, my dad was close by and he shouted, get back on the bike. And, and with, I think more frightened of him that I had done something to the brand new bike I got, I got back on the bike. But that's the right thing to do, you know. If, if that calamity happens, just to get back. Hey, when we know we've sinned and we're asking God for help and he gives us a word into our head or into our soul, get back on the bike. So in the passage from Matthew 11, John the Baptist is in jail and he sends messages to Jesus to ask, are you really the one? Now, he knows he's the one because he said that's the one who takes away the sin of the world. That's the one who fills us with the Holy Spirit. But in jail, he remembers one of the promises is that the Messiah will set captives free. And he's in jail. What for? For doing God's laws. So Jesus tells John's messengers to go back to him and tell him all that they see and hear about the life and work of Jesus. And as the messengers go back to John, Jesus talks to the crowd, basically confirming that John is the greatest person that has lived in his obedience to God. But Jesus reveals what Paul discovers in himself and in all of us, that we are impossible to please. Jesus uses the thing like children being pleased and then not pleased at, in, 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 in a flash of a moment. Just what we want is what's what we want. In his infinite kindness, Jesus tells the crowd that he is God in their midst. He is the Messiah. And then he invites them, come you are weary, bone weary, overloaded with life. Come, come to me. Learn from me. 
and you'll discover rest. You know, among the many things that Alcoholics Anonymous has taught me is that alcohol will give you the ability or the belief that you can do anything except give up alcohol. You know, alcohol is killing you and the family, but it whispers to you, one more for the road. <laughs> you know it's destroying life, but it whispers to you, one more will make everything feel and seem and be better. It's the law of death that's at work within us. We do what we know we shouldn't do. Jesus says, come to me. I'm gentle. I'm not going to rub your nose in the dirt. Learn from me. My way is right. My yoke is well fitting. The path is easy. Hmm. Jesus' hearers, like John himself, were at a crossroads. Like we are, every time we face these decisions. Sometimes before we do wrong, the choice is before us. Sometimes we've slipped and gone wrong, we've obeyed the wrong law, but we know and the Spirit's bringing us back to, to get back on the right road. But like an addiction, like alcohol, we can destroy ourselves by staying on the wrong path. It's the way of fools. It's full of self-deception and self-delusion. I think we end up doing what we hate. There's another way forward. So listen to this. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 8 to talk of the Holy Spirit, of us being led by the Spirit, of us being filled by the Spirit, of the Spirit helping us even to pray. When we don't know what to say, the Spirit will pray through us like a groan. Jesus will go on to tell the crowds and his disciples, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit to those who ask for the gift of the Spirit. He puts it very bluntly. He says to his hearers, even as you are, you know how to give good gifts to your children. You're not going to give them a stone when they're asking for a bread. And then he ends the little passage by saying, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to those who ask him? So folks, some laws cannot be broken, like the law of gravity. And some laws cannot be broken, like the law of coming to God. It's to come in humility and repentance and saying, please fill me again with your Holy Spirit. Here's the law. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that he's the Lord. So as seriously and as gently as I can, I want to ask you whether you're listening to this by the YouTube or whether you're here this morning. When last did you seriously, seriously say, Lord Jesus, please fill me with your spirit? When last did you take the time maybe to kneel? I don't kneel anymore. I sit in a chair and pray. But when last did you take the time to say, Lord, I'm messing up. My life's a mess. My relationships are not great. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit. I'd like saying grace. Lord, bless the hands that have made this. Bless us as we eat it. And before long, you've stuffed your whole face. But seriously, to pause and, and to expect a response when you say, Lord, please give me your Holy Spirit. Children who are desperate for sleep and don't go to sleep can be quite irritating. They upset the whole house. They know what to do, but they don't do it. We need the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says, ask, ask. Let me end with this. <clears throat> I've always been amazed, hated this, but always been amazed that I could be trying to counsel a couple in their marriage. They have asked for it. They have come forward. And one of the things that often is repeated is the wife says, he never says to me, I love you. So I turn to the guy and I say to him, do you love her? And he says, she knows I do. I said, no, 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 no. Will you tell her now that you love her? Why, he says, why must I say it? She knows I love her. And I say to him, because she's asking you right now, just to say it, three words. His response, 
this is just ridiculous, Rod. And he's feeding, he's feeding. As he's crying and she's crying, she's choking, thinking, he doesn't really love me. He can't get it out of his mouth. And he's mad as hell angry that he's been manipulated by minister and by wife. And he's not going to give in at this point. And what's happening is the law of self-preservation is crushing them both. They need to stop and get to pray for the gift of the Spirit. When did you get married? What was the day and the time and the place? Uh, did you have sex before marriage? Weren't you married then? Or perhaps you only got married when you consummated the marriage? <laughs> I have a little letter from a couple I married thanking me for consummating their marriage. <laughs> Do you know that in South African law, marriages happen, they are now legally true, simply when the couple say, I do. If they simply say the words to each other in the presence of other witnesses, that constitutes a marriage. It doesn't have to be written up in a marriage register. Of course it is, but it doesn't have to be. The promise is good. And Jesus is saying, Ask for the Spirit, very publicly now. If you're present, I'm going to ask you to come forward and stand with me here and pray with me to be filled with the Spirit. If you're at home, Stellenbosch members or anyone watching, perhaps now's the time for you to kneel if you can, sit if you can't, and seriously from your heart say, I'm tired of this law in me that produces death. Please, Lord Jesus, fill me again with your Holy Spirit and ask believingly. Come forward now, will you? Amen.